We ready? <clears throat> Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to day two of the Telford Muse Prophecy Conference. Yesterday was very enlightening with many things addressed including a lot of wonderful tools that we're going to be able to use as we continue through this conference. Shall we thank our Heavenly Father for His blessings and His guidance before we address this study? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing these last many days. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to open your word, to be guided by that which prophets of old have provided for our learning. We ask today, Father, that you guide us we ask for wisdom from you, for all wisdom comes from you. We ask, Father, that your angels may attend us, that your spirit may enlighten us. Help us to draw closer to you. I pray for angels to surround everyone that is attending these messages, either in person or by the Internet. We ask for your direction. We thank you for all that you provided yesterday and all that you will provide today. Hide me behind your cross, Father, so that it is your character that others see, that it is your words that they hear. Direct us now, for this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> This morning's message, this morning's study, is going to be called, What Message? Now, we touched briefly yesterday on the fact that Mrs. White has been very clear about what we are to be presenting. Are we to have a new message today? <clears throat> here we have a chart. And here we have a chart. What symbols do we have on these charts that are relevant to us today? There will be many that will be frustrated by this. Right? Yet we also have all of these symbols are relevant today. But are there more? As we look here, we have symbols of right? As we go through this, step by step, we're going to be looking at the message. We're going to be looking at what Sister White has offered. And pay attention, because at the end, there will be a test, but this test is going to be handed out for us to consider until our next meeting. God has a church upon earth who are his chosen people, who keep his commandments. 
This statement was made in letter 57 of 1893. God has a church who keep his commandments. Why is this important? What's being identified here? If God has a church on earth that are keeping his commandments, are these not those that are set aside to give a message? There are many churches but are all churches keeping the commandments? Do all churches seek to study to understand what God's commandments are? He is leading not stray, offshoots, not one here or there, but a people. The truth is a sanctifying power. Just a thought on this. Um, yes. Because you asked the question. Yes. Are churches seeking to keep God's commandments? And what most churches are concerned with are beliefs, mm-hmm. but not obedience. And faith without works is dead. Amen. So, if the truth, and I, I appreciate that thought. If the truth is a sanctifying power, is this not the second step that we look toward from Scripture to understand more clearly what God would have of us? We have justification, which occurs when we come to the cross. We start to understand the truth, we start to understand the commandments, and we become sanctified. But the church militant is not yet the church triumphant. Why? There are tares among the wheat. Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Was the question asked by the servants. But the master said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Matthew 13, 8, 28, 29, sorry. <clears throat> the gospel net draws not only the good fish, but the bad ones as well. And the Lord knows who are his. Do we not, brothers and sisters, look to be the Lord's? If we are going to be the Lord's people, we need to be searching the scriptures, as did the pioneers, as did the faithful Bereans, as did the disciples, as did the prophets of old. It is our individual duty to walk humbly with God. Now, If we're going to walk humbly with God, can we afford to have preconceived ideas? Can we afford for our ego to be the controlling interest? We are not to seek any strange new message. We are not to think that the chosen ones of God who are trying to walk in the light compose Babylon. Is this not great light? Is this not what the pioneers of the faith came to understand was ordained of God? 
What did Sister White say about these two charts? Who directed these charts? Was it not the hand of God? Were these not the tables that are addressed in the book of Habakkuk? The fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Now, am I saying that? I find it written in letter 57, 1893. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. I look on this chart. Where comes the wine in the cup that is to soon reach its brim? Is it from Bible truths? Or is it coming from something else? This wine of error is made up of false doctrines, such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked, the denial of the pre-existence of Christ prior to his birth in Bethlehem, and the advocating and exalting of the first day of the week above God's holy sanctified day. Is that clear enough for us? Is there anything else that we need to address? I mean, these doctrines permeate so many. These and kindred errors are presented to the world by the various churches, and thus the scriptures are fulfilled that say, for all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 18.3. Do we seek today in the study of symbols, in the study of chronology, to be drinking the wine of Babylon? It is a wrath which created by false doctrines when kings and presidents drink this wine of the wrath of her fornication, they are stirred with anger against all who will not come into harmony with these false and satanic heresies that exalt the false Sabbath and lead men to trample underfoot God's memorial. Fallen angels upon the earth form confederacies with evil men. What is a confederacy? An alliance. An alliance. What else is it? What else can we call it? An agreement. What else can we call it? Covenant. Covenant? As we continue in this in this series of studies, we're going to look at many Bible verses that warn us about forming a league. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. When is the law of God fully made void? At the the universal Sunday law, right? Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe, but the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him. But omnipotence will interpose, and the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord that judges her. Revelation 18, 8. When do the plagues begin to fall? After this deception where Satan has appeared as an angel of light, according to this paragraph. (coughs) 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things who must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear a record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Revelation 1, verses 1 and 2. How does prophecy come? How does the word of God come to us? It comes from the Father. To the Son. To His angel. From the Father to the Son to his angel, to the prophet. Now we've identified several times from the spirit of prophecy that his angel is Gabriel. <clears throat> Why is this important for us to recognize? Is this not a direct chain from the heavenly throne to us? Is our heavenly Father, is Christ consistent in all that they do? Let those who desire a special blessing heed the following words. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written herein, for the time is at hand. What does it mean to you that the time is at hand? Is the time long past? Is the time somewhere in the future? The time is at hand. The time is now. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that is, has loved us and washed us from our sins in our own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Saith the Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that was called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 verses 3 to 9. John had a message for the people in his day. Does John have a message for us today? But the people became so tired of hearing of Jesus and of the characters they were to perfect through him that they even thought to kill this faithful messenger. Are you tired of hearing of Jesus? Are you tired of hearing what he wants us to do? Are you tired of hearing that he wants us to perfect a character that's like his? That we can become like Christ? Christ? 
But at that time, the people sought to kill John. How many people have we seen in recent months that are opposing a message based upon symbols? Are we not facing the same type of opposition that was faced by John? This plan being thwarted, they banished him to the lone, rocky Isle of Patmos. They thought that if he were separated from his fellow men, his testimony would be silenced and he would live out the remainder of his life in a mournful solitude. But God was with this lonely exile and opened to his view the glories of heaven and the things which must shortly come to pass. It's not always easy when we have to stand in front of our friends. When our friends are telling us that this is false. Oh, that these are yet to occur. That these symbols mean nothing. Yet, this message exists with these charts. We have, as did John, a message to bear of the things that we have seen and heard. Have we not seen wondrous things coming from this study of Joshua and Judges? Have we not found evidences to strengthen our faith at this time? God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the old message that brought us out of the churches in 1843 and 1844. What was the message proclaimed in 1843 and 1844? Gee, 1843 chart. The prophetic times. Here? The prophetic times. Here? The prophetic times, here and here. The pioneers understood by searching the scriptures the relevance of these symbols. Can any less be expected of us today? John continues, These things we write unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Revelation 1 verse 5. Is John right? Is there darkness in God? Don't take my word for it. Take the words of John. Take the words of Scripture. Is there darkness in Jehovah? The Lord does not want us to walk in darkness and perplexity. He desires us to know the truth as it is in Jesus and wherever we go to proclaim that truth by word of mouth and also by our life and practice, we must reveal Jesus to the world. Is that not the work that's presented before us today? If we are living according to what God would have us to do, then our characters are becoming more like his. We are speaking and living as Christ did. God expects you as a church to be purified and refined. How hard is that to hear today? What does it mean to be refined? Well, 
Well, if you're, if you're talking about precious metals, they need to be, like gold, it would need to be refined in a fire. Everyone that is here are the precious metal as God sees you. Consider that for a moment. I haven't always lived my life for Christ. There's many things in my life I have not been proud of. But God is willing to refine those issues in my character out of my character. How does a refiner do that? They sit before the fire. They sit to watch that these issues of character are being removed. Where it comes to gold, where it comes to silver. They wait until the dross has been burned out. And the only thing that remains in that metal is reflection of the refiner. One moment later, the metal is destroyed. So the metal is removed the moment they see his reflection in the metal. <clears throat> Why is Christ not returned? The Christ has not returned because our Heavenly Father sees that the church is not willing to make herself ready. It's like asking a bride. Your husband wants to marry you. Your husband desires to be with you. But you decide, well, he can wait. I'm not through yet with what I want. He'll still be there. I don't need to worry about that. The church has not wanted to make herself ready. Put away all accusing and dissension. Lay aside all fault finding and jealousy and let everyone come up to the help of the Lord. You need to arise and trim your lamps that, you, that they, the lamps, may give a clearer light. Who is trimming their lamps at this time? What parable are we referencing here? Five are wise and five are foolish. Are we ready for the coming of the bridegroom? Are we ready to make ourselves ready? All should appreciate what is being done to bring the truth before unbelievers. Let the older members be an example to those who have recently come into the truth. I entreat those who have been long in the truth not to hurt the new converts by living irreligious lives. Lay aside all murmuring and do thorough work in your own hearts. Break up the fallow ground of your hearts and seek to know what you can do to advance the work, not only in Los Angeles, not only in Leduc, not only in Spokane, everywhere. Temptations are being brought in by men who have been long in the truth. Sad to hear that. The truths that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844 are now to be studied and proclaimed. 
this chart was used to show prophetic representations of what the Millerites believed was going to occur. What was the Millerites' mistake? Okay, so what? What did you say? The sanctuary? The earth was the sanctuary? Well, that's part of their mistake. But, uh... Millerite's mistake, was it not in trying to set time? Yeah, and, and it's interesting, too, because we as Seventh-day Adventists, it, well, we should, except that God led them. Exactly. And yet they had clear counsel in the Bible against time setting. Amen. And, and they had ways around that. Um, and yet God was still leading them. Yes. But does it make the truths that were studied at that time any less relevant? Absolutely not. <clears throat> the messages of the first, second, and third angel will in the future be proclaimed with a loud voice. They will be given with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit. And this was written in 1905. We have come to an understanding and we have observed that we have been relearning the messages of the first and the second angel. We are relearning those messages in order to be prepared to give the message of the third angel. Can you have a third angel without first having the first and the second? Can you clearly understand the message of the third if you don't understand the first and the second? The promise of special protection and prosperity to those who faithfully heed the, the Lord's instruction regarding tithes and offerings was not a new message. Delivered by Malachi, early in the history of the Israelites, the Lord through Moses covenanted with his people that if they would obey his commandments, he would give them rain in due season, the land should yield her increase, and the trees of the field should yield their fruit. What commandments is she talking about? What covenant is she talking about? Consider this. I spelled that right? Yeah. Okay. Early on with the children of Israel, God in bringing them to Sinai sought to explain to them what he expected of them. One of the things that came out from study, one of the things that came out from learning what Brother Stephen, Brother Theodore, and the tools that Brother Aran has been showing us how to use, has been showing to me, is that Exodus 20 to 23 is important for us to understand. Why is that important for us to understand? Consider this. 
these three chapters were presented before the children of Israel in a single day. This wasn't a drawn out situation. This was one day. Many of us will focus just on Exodus 20. But Exodus 20 to 23 is the covenant that God presented before his people. He sought to enter into a league with his people. He wanted to be joined to his people. Is entering into a covenant important? What other covenant relationships can we, can we address? Is this not the same as entering into a marriage? So if God is seeking to enter into a league with us, are we to enter into a league with any others? <clears throat> he promised that their threshing should reach unto the vintage, and their vintage unto the sowing time, and that they should eat their bread to the full and dwell in their land safely. But they disregarded his requirements. He would deal with them entirely contrary to all of this. His curse should rest upon them in the place of his blessing. He would break the pride of their power and would make the heavens over them as iron and the earth as brass. Your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if ye walk contrary unto me, then I also will walk contrary unto you. Leviticus 26, 20 to 24. If we're not in league with God, who are we in league with? Is the league important for us to understand? Is this a symbol that we need to pay attention with for this time in earth's history? Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. A blessing if you obey what is written, Exodus 20 to 23, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. See Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28. Moses multiple times reminded the children of Israel that God wanted them as his special people. He wanted them as his bride. How many times did the children of Israel turn their back on the one that loved him so, that loved them so? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Can we consider a thousand generations right now? Can we even wrap our minds around that? And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. 
These words should be distinctly stamped upon every soul as if written with a pen of iron. Obedience brings reward. Disobedience, it's retribution. Southern Watchman, 21st of February, 1905. Today, there are those that are the watchmen on the walls. What is the biblical symbol of the wall? If we were to go through the Bible, if we were to go through the spirit of prophecy, what is the biblical symbol of the wall? Well, the Ten Commandments. Is it not a law? Yep, the law. A statute. Yet many times in the Bible are we not told of those that piss us against the wall? What are we seeing there when this when this is being shown to us in scripture? It's not a woman that would do that. It's a man. And what is the symbol of man in Scripture? The state. The state. So when the state is pissing against the wall, they're pissing against the law of God. Yet, we need today for these words to be written on our souls as if they're written with a pen of iron. Today, as in the days of the Jewish nation, God's prospering hand attends the obedient. We prosper when we obey. We fail when we don't obey. And those whom the Lord blesses are ever to be mindful of his mercies. Their gifts are in accordance with the blessings received. But many whom God prospers manifest base ingratitude toward him. When blessings rest upon them, their substance is increased. They make their bounties as cords to bind them to the love of their possessions. They allow worldly business to take control of their affections and of their entire being. Turning the blessings of God into a curse, they serve their own temporal interests to the neglect of God's requirements. Are we to neglect what God would require of us? What is our duty? What does it say in Scripture? The duty of man. To do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. Are we to walk around saying, I'm blessed, I can do anything. No. We are to walk humbly before God because He is providing everything for us. The Lord is good and greatly to be praised. I will not complain. I feel very sad over the state of things Here, she says, in Battle Creek. I feel very sad over the state of things all over, especially within the church. I am trying to do all that is possible to guard the flock of God from falling into error. God alone can keep them and through them work out his good pleasure. 
I am satisfied with the working of the Lord. If unbelief is multiplied through the exercise of unbelief in the testimonies, having done all we can do, we will talk faith and work on the affirmative side of the question. If my name is cast out as evil, I am in excellent company. How many times has Mrs. White's name been cast out as not being a prophet? How many times has it been said that her testimonies, her writings, are pastoral and not prophetic? How many times has has what she has written been set aside? Is it any different than what we've seen in Scripture itself? Oh, well, God doesn't mind if we break the commandments. It's only one. Yet if we break one commandment, we break them all. Those who would not receive Christ were dead in trespasses and sins. May that not be said of us. As they looked upon the evidence that he is presenting by curing disease and making the suffering ones rejoice in health, why did they not yield their unbelief? Because by such an action they would have confessed themselves to be sinners. In the place of receiving the evidence offered them, in the place of recognizing in Christ's work the endowment of heaven, they held right on to their wicked purposes and said, He has performed this wonderful work through the devil. Letter 34, 1906. This was the sin against the Holy Ghost. Isn't that an interesting definition? They ascribe the works of Christ to that of our adversary. This is the sin against the Holy Ghost. When Christ was on the earth, this was the sin against the Holy Ghost. They had not forgiveness in this world, nor in the world to come. What reason had Christ given them for making this statement? None at all. The prince of life was seeking the lost sheep. Has he not sought every one of us? Have we not been the lost sheep? At last the leaders of Israel would put him to death. What had he done? He had expressed to a rebellious world the love of God. And his death was the great free will offering for sin. But if a fountain of mercy was open to the world, yet to be convinced of the wonderful sacrifice made in order that whoever believed in Christ should not perish but have everlasting life. The preaching of the gospel gives sinners opportunity to receive the greatest gift ever proffered human beings. Those who refuse this gift reveal the highest contempt for God. What does it say then for those that choose to refuse the gospel? The gospel is the message of Revelation 14. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Do we wish to have contempt for what God has done for us? Are we going to show contempt for Christ? It is our privilege to be partakers of the divine nature. 
If we be falsified, men give to the world a misstatement of the work that God has done through the humble instrument, dishonoring Christ by making a misrepresentation of him. They are partakers of the shame and the reproach that are brought then upon me. We, are, we understand the present feebleness and smallness of the work. We have had an experience in doing the work that God has given us. We may go trustingly forward, assured that he will be our efficiency. He will be with us in 1906. He will be with us in 2023. As he was with us in 1841, 1842, 1843, and in 1844. Oh, what wonderful evidences we have had then of the presence of God with us. Are these not wonderful evidence that God is with us yet? Have we not seen power from the prophecies that are presented in these charts, in these symbols that we need yet to understand? If the Lord is leading us, we may go forward courageously, assured that he will be with us as he was with us in past years, as we labored in feebleness, but under the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. The miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. Are we trying to set aside that power to do things in our way? Or are we becoming reliant completely upon our Heavenly Father and upon the Spirit that He has sent to us as a comforter? Assured that he will be with us as he was with us in past years, as we labored in feebleness, but now under the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. He will be with us as he was with us when we had to meet the opposing influences of erroneous theories. What erroneous theories were being met here? Brothers and sisters, we're going to be addressing the situation that in this church, over the last 83 years, that many in leadership have chosen to set aside the very understandings which brought people out of the churches in 1841, 42, 43, and 44. Many of the most successful undertakings made in behalf of the truth were, have at the beginning been small and have cost many tears and prayers. At the beginning of our work, some brought in grave errors. And meeting these placed upon us much hard labor and such difficulties as God's help alone could enable us to overcome. We prayed a great deal. Often we wrestled whole nights in prayer. Then the light, precious light on Bible truth would come upon the whole company assembled. What a promise. All could understand the difficulties and the truth of the Bible was comprehended and substantiated. Is this not what we should have today? Should we not have faith and seeing that these truths of the Bible are now being brought clearer and being substantiated? Thus we worked and thus we prayed. 
Errors were continually brought in, but we went to God in prayer and searched the scriptures diligently. Over these last many years, over these last three years, have we not searched the scriptures day by day to understand more of what God would have us to know? Have we not taken the time to eat of his word, to consider carefully that which is being presented? Year after year, after the passing of time, many false theories were presented, but we collected our forces in favorable places and continued in prayer, watching, praying, and searching the scriptures. Then light was given to the very youngest of those assembled and the truth of the word of God in regard to the position we were occupying was plainly specified. The time of respite granted us seemed short, too short to open to the world the great and wonderful things of God's law, the promises of God, how we laid hold upon them. We could not bear all the glory our physical strength left us, and the power of God, like a halo of glory, was over us. What praises went to Jehovah? Yet a little while, and he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Hebrews 10.37 There was a tarrying time for us, but he, our Lord, knew the end from the beginning. It was no delay, and from year to year we worked and we prayed and we believed. The errors that were rushing in upon us, we met with the power of God and explained them. And the glory filled the room where we were assembled. We had thought that the work would have been accomplished before this, but the light came from the Lord regarding the extension of the work. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. If all power is given to Christ... then the message that Christ is giving us is directly from the throne of God himself. This power we needed then in the early history of our work. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 19. Are we told in any way that we are to baptize in the name of a creed or a church? We are told that we are to baptize in the name of Jehovah, of his Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then we understood that there was a world to be warned teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Matthew 28, 20. Here was our work, our commission. The truth was to go into every city in America, and we were to gather up our forces to proclaim the message in the regions beyond. 2 Corinthians ten sixteen. Had the work been done that God designed should be done, the condition of things in our world would now be very different. But the professing followers of Christ are asleep. The churches have not fulfilled the solemn charge laid upon them. Men placed as watchmen have been asleep at their post, and many refuse to wake up. They are not fulfilling the gospel commission. 
they are indeed showing the highest contempt for God. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted up and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We need a firm reliance upon God if we would be saved from the power of satanic agencies. If we don't want to be saved from the agencies of the adversary, then we have a problem. If we will keep close to the teachings of the word, the truths that the word will be our safeguard, saving us from the delusions of this last days. We need the truth. We need to believe in it. Its principles are adapted to all circumstances of life. We, they prepare the soul for duty and brace it for trial. They bear the stamp of the divine author. Upon all with whom they are brought into contact, they exert a preserving influence. The natural substance, the natural stubbornness of the human heart resists the light of truth. Its natural pride of opinion leads to independence of judgment and a clinging to human ideas and philosophy. There is with some a constant danger of becoming unsettled in the faith by the desire for originality. They wish to find some new and strange truth to present, to have a new message to bring to the people. But such a desire is a snare of the enemy to captivate the mind and lead away from truth. Review and Herald, August 19th, 1909. In an unpublished letter written in 1910, Mrs. White states, I have, Elder Daniels, a message to bear. The representation given me is that we as a people are in need of daily being converted. How many people do we know that say, oh, on August 13th, 1980, I came to Christ. Yet what does she say here? We as a people need to be daily converted. The work of God is as verily needed to reconvert his people who have had the light as it was in the giving of the first and second angel's messages in 1841, 1842, and 1843. Are we in need of being reconverted today? Mrs. White would tell us so. She said this to A.G. Daniels, the former, at that time, president of the General Conference. She's very clear. First and second angel's message. Here, we have elements of the third angel's message, but we've not fully understood it. We have the sanctuary, yet many over the years have sought that these charts and the symbols therein should be set aside. These were the messages that were presented. These symbols were also presented. Are they any less important for us today than they were then?
Satan is surely triumphing over the long delay in warning the cities of the East, and the West will become awakened as this work shall be entered upon. What's she saying here? Consider it carefully. The West shall be awakened. True, in some places the cities have been touched, but work? No, no. There is a great work to begin right in the cities in the very best way possible. There cannot now be delays. While the Sunday question is in agitation, let the arguments be presented coming from the Lord God of heaven in the spirit of the great teacher. When the truth is proclaimed in our cities, let it be under the divine influence. Angels of God will make the impressions. Do we need to make the impressions? No. The angels of God will make the impressions. It's our job to present this. While, <clears throat> while errors are flooding the world, as a people we are not to congregate in a few favorite places. Those who carry no special burden of the work are a hindrance to those who do bear the burdens. The Sunday question is being agitated, and all through our cities there should be men who will hold forth the evidence which is so abundant in the word in regard to the true Sabbath. Now, One of the points that was addressed very clearly before has to do with Daniel eight thirteen and 14. We cannot afford to set this aside any more than we can afford to set this aside or this or this or this. Yet, for 83 years within this church, this has been debated. It has been questioned, and in many ways, since Glacier View in 1980, it has been set aside. <clears throat> the test I present before you There's a document that will go out with this recording. The document's title is The Vision of the Evenings and the Mornings. The document's title is part of a sermon that was given by someone that is not in this message. Yet, almost everything that this person has had to offer is in line with what was addressed at Glacier View. Glacier View, for many, was a watershed moment because that watershed meant that many within the church chose to set aside multiple understandings that came from the study of Daniel 8, 13, and 14. The test that we're going to go through, how do we understand this message as did the pioneers? How would we be able to defend our understanding in the types and symbols of this message and from it what can we take today to understand the faith that is given to us. Is it important for us to understand 
the 2300 Arab and Boker, the evening morning of this section of Daniel, is important for us to understand this for this time in our history. <clears throat> so, do we have any questions or do we have any comments at this point? Okay, so it's even more important that we understand it than it was for their time. But can we explain it? Are we able to defend our position any better than the leadership did in 1980 at Glacier View? When Desmond Ford came out to say that there is no biblical relevance within the positions taken by the pioneers to this prophecy. Can we defend that today? Are we able to give an answer for the faith that is within us? That is the test that we're going to address. Now, this will be an open book test. You've got the Bible. Specifically, we're going to center on Daniel 8, Daniel 9. We're going to look at this situation. It's not going to be a hard test. It's just a question. Can you defend the position? Any other thoughts or any other comments? Uh, just one comment. Uh, so one comment, which I put in the chat, it's um, the Glacier View started on August 10th, yes. 1980. And uh, that would be 14,588 days inclusive to July 18, 2020. That's 494 months or 2,084 weeks. That's the period uh, of the manna. Right. On just another point of false doctrine that's entered in, uh, it would be the state of dead. Right. Because I mean, the state of the dead is something that we should be well centered on. Yet, how many times do we encounter those? within the church that when someone passes they are celebrating oh my loved one is now with the Lord my loved one is now with others of the family I can't tell you how many times I've heard that within the church today it throws me Yes, it is a very open door to spiritualism. Can we afford to invite our adversary to take control of our lives? And that's what that is. Any other thoughts? Any other comments? Shall we then close with prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. We thank you for allowing us to open your word and that of your prophets. Direct us now, Father, show us that which you would have us to understand. Be with us the rest of this day. Help us so that our minds may be open and ready to receive the instruction that you are providing. Help us to learn how to use 
the tools that are being presented. Help us to learn to properly apply that which you are presenting through your speakers. Direct us this day. Be with us. We ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.